Now, as Krishna was coming in, what happened was that he was entering in and calling him. Can you mute everyone else? So, yesterday I stopped at the point where all of the Dwarkavas is saying that we could not live without you. And we're delighted to have, that you have you back. And that there is the remembrance of Krishna, but the perception of Krishna is still even more relishable. And that's what they are longing for over here. Now, as they enter, there's a customary description of how Krishna was welcomed grandly, how there were arrangements to welcome him. And that signifies respect. You know, a very special person is coming, we arrange for their respect, arrange for their respect. By arranging for their welcome, by respecting, by arranging properly. Now, most of the things seem very, uh, very soothing and standard in one sense. There are Brahmanas reciting verses, there are people coming out and Krishna is reciprocating with them. But there's one verse here which suddenly raises a question. This is 19th verse. So, Varamukhya Shashatasho. So, Varamukhya Shatasho. Shatasho here refers to hundreds. Hundreds. Sahasra Shata. Sahasra is what? Thousand. So, Shata is hundred. So, Shatasho. Now, Varamukhya refers to prostitutes. So, hundreds of prostitutes. Yana is Darshan so they yeah they also came out darshan utsuka they were also utsuka eager for the darshan of the lord lasat kundala nirbhat kapolava and then how they were how they were beautifully decorated and how they were delighted on seeing krishna that is described so now this description raises question or because there are many questions so let's start with what question does it raise in a very obvious sense? Why are there prostitutes in Dwarka? Yes, why are there prostitutes in Dwarka? Anything else? Why is he elaborating on their beauty? What's okay. The why is Shukadeva Goswami talking, so talking about that also? Why is the beauty described? Okay. What's the question from this one? Okay, that's it. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. I hope I'm grateful that you. Yeah, I'm grateful. You. Yeah, you can hear me now. That's good. Okay, good. So it seems that all mics and my associate become humble. <laughs> huh? Yeah, but at reflecting me, that you a disservice to me. <laughs> so I'm good. I'm glad you at least you didn't have the humility. <laughs> you just go on in the class, you ask the question, or what is the question? <laughs> okay. So the question was why is there a reference to what that seeing the reference to prostitutes here? It raises several questions. So to understand this. There are two main points which I will mention and then we will elaborate on these points. See, when we want to understand scripture, it's um, vital to recognize the difference between what is descriptive and what is prescriptive in scripture. Descriptive means it says how things are at that time. And prescriptive is this is how things should be. And these two are not the same. Even at the time of scripture, Whenever it is spoken, it is not that society was ideal. Say, for example, Krishna himself says, when does he come to speak the Bhagavad Gita? When there is dharmasya glani. By the power of time, there is degradation. And that's the time when Krishna comes. So, the society that is there when Krishna is coming, it's not necessary that everything in that society is ideal. It's not necessary that that social descriptions of those times are prescriptive. And this is how we should live. 
So let's take a very clear example and then we'll go into a little bit uh, hazy territory. Say for example, uh, if we consider the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Mahaprabhu primarily lives in two places. Which are the two main places? Naudvi and Jagannath Puri. And in Jagannath Puri, Mahaprabhu every day goes to meet one particular associate and offers him Jagannath Prasad. Who is that associate? Haridas Thakur. Now, why does Mahaprabhu go to his house or his Siddhabakul place? Yeah, he is not allowed to come to the temple because he was born in the Malikcha family. Now, is this descriptive that that Haridas Thakur is not allowed to enter the Jagannath temple? Is this descriptive or is it prescriptive? Descriptive, isn't it? Chita Prabhupada strongly opposed it. He says, he's Jagannath. Why are you making him Bharatnath? He's, he's the lord of the universe. Now, there are reasons historically that when invaders came and they saw, for them, either the, the worship of Jagannath was so opulent, that they said, no, we want, we want to stop this. Or it was that it was so weird. It's just like it, Jagannath is made of wood. So it's like the, it's the emblem of what the Abrahamic tradition can take, considers the idolatry. But at least if somebody looks like a human being, it's different. It doesn't even look like a human being. So this is like primitive kind of worship. So many of the invaders, they criticized it. Some of the invaders also devastated it. So there are historical reasons why certain groups of people are not allowed over there. But those are not necessarily universal or scriptural or essential. So this is a difference between the descriptive and the prescriptive. So everything in scripture is not the teaching of scripture. This is an important point to understand because otherwise we may get lost in things which are not really relevant. So just to elaborate this point further between the descriptive and the prescriptive, we see this in many places. So, for example, in scripture, it is described how say, demons like Hiranyakashipu, they would destroy sacrificial arenas. They would uh, destroy the sacred things. Yes. Uh, sacred things. So now, is that something which, if you have to follow scripture, you're supposed to do that? No. Obviously not. That we can easily understand because that is demons doing it. Mm -hmm. And demon, demons' actions are not to be done. So, so there we can clearly understand this is descriptive and this is not at all prescriptive. In fact, the prescription is opposite of that. But there are times when scripture describes something without any context to nuance or qualify or aid us in understanding. So, so that means this is just a passing description. Now, as far as Mahaprabhu himself is concerned, if you read the Chaitanya Charitamrita itself, neither Mahaprabhu nor uh, Krishna Skiraj Goswami actually speak disapprovingly of that social arrangement. That, that at that time, that was just the norm and they accepted it. So Mahaprabhu, in one sense, we could say is a more of a reformer than a revolutionary. A reformer is a person who slow changes. Okay, you got this house. You know, this, this paint doesn't look very good. Can you change the paint of this portion? <laughs> <laughs> well, mm, whether the comment is literal is up to you. <laughs> so then somebody will say, okay, you know, maybe the floor is, you know, in a different floor. Maybe, you know this, you know this. So reformer is gradual changes. And the last comment is definitely not literal. <laughs> a revolutionary will come and say, you know, just blow up this house and build a new one. <laughs> so Mahaprabhu in many ways is a reformer, not a revolutionary. So he chose his battles and fought certain battles and let certain battles not be fought. So from the Chaitanya Charitamrita itself, we may not get an understanding that this is, is this prescriptive? Well, Mahaprabhu doesn't insist on it. So it's not prescription. Mahaprabhu doesn't give an instruction. He never tells Haridas Thakur, you should not go to them. That's the accepted norm, he accepts it. That's the social norm, he accepts it. So 
in some cases, the difference between descriptive and prescriptive may not be so clear, especially when certain actions are not opposed or condemned. They're not either they are done by villainous characters or they are not criticized by those who are saintly or devoted or virtuous. Then it might lead to a little confusion. So at that time, when we have to when we have to understand this, we have to go a little deeper into what is going on. So there is a there is there is some whenever a point is spoken, if in a in a class a point is spoken or in a scripture a point is given. See, there is the point, and there is the point of the point. Mm. <laughs> the point of the point means why is it being spoken? And sometimes it may happen that we we understand the point but we don't understand the point of the point isn't it like some some scripture some some teachers there some speakers they were a little disorganized or sometimes to put it in a more polite way their organization is incomprehensible to the audience <laughs> 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 so okay you spoke this point and you spoke this point and you spoke this point okay what are you trying to say <laughs> so we need to understand the point of the point hmm? okay this is this is an interesting example but what is the example for so sometimes um, we have some humor in the class and humor is good in the sense that at least it keeps the audience awake <laughs> humor also is uh, humor also keep, Activates the brain, but the problem could be that we remember the humor and we forget the point which is illustrated through humor. <laughs> so that's why there is a point and there is the point of the point. And if we can get the point of the point, then the point then the point starts making sense. So that's why now sometimes what happens is the point and the point of the point may not only be different. Or for the from the audience perspective, but they may be completely tangential. Like once I was speaking uh, this uh, Damodar Lila to a Western audience, and then I spoke it, and uh, this one one woman she was getting very agitated. She was describing the past time how Mother Isha was chasing Krishna and how uh, how she caught him and she tied him up, and then as I was describing this. This is child abuse. <laughs> How can you tie a child like this? <laughs> it's now they said that is not the point. Is it? <laughs> so what happens is. Here, the point of the whole pastime is how Yashoda Mai loves Krishna and how Krishna is Krishna is conquered by her love. That love is so great that he allows himself to be born. But what happens is sometimes the point may be so inflammatory that people don't get to the point of the point of the So this pastime, it's a very sweet pastime, but it actually can leave a very sour taste in some people's minds. So in the Western world, this idea of tying. Is actually is considered very a big intrusion on people's freedom. So when I have these crutches, so in India I got crutches which were which have like straps around it, which you can use to. So even if I'm not holding the crutches, still they stay in the arms. But when I had gone to Australia, I, my crutches broke at that time, so I wanted to buy crutches. They said we don't provide crutches with these straps because the straps are considered like restraints. And they are like intrusion on a person's freedom. So I said, you know, they are a facility for me. They are not a intrusion for my freedom. <laughs> so they make things easier, but for them, it's it's tougher. So what happens is there is a cultural context in which certain points may be pursued in certain ways. So we so, so that's why the point and the point of the point. The two can be uh, uh, may not always go together, and that's why understanding both is important. Otherwise, just the point stays in the mind, and then how can you speak like this? How can we do like this? What's going on over here? So there's the point, and there's the point of the point. So in fact, there are three things. 
we need when we are hearing we understand a point then we understand the point of the point or not sharing the screen okay so there is the point and there is the okay yeah we understand the point then we understand the point of the point and then we understand the point in the light of the point of the point <laughs> okay <laughs> so okay what is so understand the point so that is okay that okay you should know i tied krishna what is the point of the point that her love is so great that even god gets conquered by it okay and in that point the point of the point the point in the light of the point of the point so what it is okay okay this is not in that culture in that time that way of discipline children was normal <laughs> so it is it may not be normal now it may not be acceptable now and we are it's not that we are imposed we are just because parents who devotee parents who hear krishna's uh, damodarilla past time they are going to tie their children now <laughs> no that's not that's not, that's understood that's not that's not prescriptive so there's a difference between the descriptive and the prescriptive and so some so when we are speaking about scripture it's very important that we be aware of how certain points may be pursued by the audience because sometimes the point and the point of the point may be lost mm-hmm. say i think just now this uh, what is that the artemis 3 was being launched by nasa uh, uh, that the space launch which is so one devotee has wrote to me you know says prabhupad said the man did not go to the moon so how is the space launch going So I said, I have a whole class on this. Maybe today evening I'll speak this. Actually, that was not the only statement that Prabhupada made. Mm-hmm. Prabhupada made many different statements on the issue. This is okay. They went to the moon, but what did they get? They just got a pile of rocks. Prabhupada said uh, in the Bhagavad Gita introduction, Prabhupada says that they went to the moon. We have endeavored a lot to rise to the moon. Let us endeavor to raise our consciousness also. So Prabhupada's point was not that man did not go to the moon. Prabhupada's point was that don't get excited by too excited by these things. The real improvement in life will happen when we raise our consciousness. Prabhupada's movement that he started was the International Society for Moon Conspiracy Exposure. <laughs> <laughs> that was not Prabhupada's mission. Prabhupada's mission was the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So. for enhancing krishna consciousness prabhupad used different points and one point was when people were very excited by this he said that hey, you know don't get the point was don't get too excited by it don't get distracted by it don't think that this is going to solve all of humanity's problems that was the point the real solution to humanity's problems will come by raising human consciousness prabhupad was not anti science in fact the first book that shri prabhupad wrote was easy journey to other planets and Do you know who that book is dedicated to? Mm-hmm. To? Mm-hmm. <laughs> to the Prabhupada is dedicated to the scientists of the world. This is not answer to the scientists of the world. So the point is that normally Prabhupada would dedicate his Gita commentary to Baldev Vidya Bhushan or dedicate his books to Bhagwan Swami Thakur or spiritual master. He's dedicating it to scientists. Now, when you dedicate it to someone, that means there's a sign of respect. These are important members of society. So, Prabhupada was by no means anti-science. So, when we look at Prabhupada's statement about the moon, which we will not look at right now, <laughs> but the point is, sometimes the point may be so inflammatory that we may miss the point of the point. The point of the point is focus on raising human consciousness, not uh, don't get too excited or distracted by other things. so similarly here what is the point coming back to our discussion here when it is said the prostitutes are okay so the point is the all attractiveness of krishna that even those who are prostitutes they are attracted to him and even they come running toward krishna and they want to have his darshan so so that he his attractiveness is such that it attracts everyone 
that is the point of this this description so everyone is attracted everyone is delighted everyone is celebrating so krishna's universal attractiveness is demonstrated to the past so that is the key point over here that even if they are they are prostitutes despite their particular profession their particular activities that did not stop krishna's attractiveness from manifesting in their heart and attracting them so the whole point of the bhagavatam is to describe how krishna is all attractive krishna is the supremely worthy object for us to focus our consciousness on the, the whole purpose of the bhagavatam is to ultimately help parikshit maharaj to remember krishna to fix his consciousness on krishna <laughs> so in that light what happens is that the focus of this particular past time is on describing how krishna was attracted attracted attractive for everyone now okay having said this still the question may come up that still but the point is still a point problem isn't it i get the point of the point but still the point is a problem okay, okay so in that case there are multiple ways to understand this so now vara mukhya does not necessarily so now I, I, there are different understandings of this and uh, uh, you so i'll share various understandings and then you can you can even in spiritual life there is a lot of room for individuality that means that it's not a scriptural understanding always one zero there can be multiple kinds of understanding and some understanding will make sense with us will click to us so vara mukhya it it the some people who say that now uh, some people means it could be tra- traditional scriptural commentators or it could be contemporary uh, sanskrit scholars or contemporary contemporary scholars this vara mukhya does not necessarily have to restrict refer to prostitute it refers to women who were dedicated to the arts like dancing singing and music mm-hmm. and these they would never get married and in that in that sense they were not uh, like other women in society now there was a, this long tradition which was there in jagannath temple which got perverted which is called devi dasis so now originally the idea was that if somebody wants to if somebody wants to really learn music really learn uh, really learn dancing or skills like this now, people can do it nicely to some extent if they have innate talent with some practice they can always do it better but somebody really wants to do it at a super excellent level it requires exclusive dedication mm. exclusive dedication so then what happens is though for preserving those art forms continuing those art forms in the past the tradition was that the art and culture was all centered around the temple around the temple around the lord that's why yukta ahar viharasya vihara means what recreation or entertainment so entertainment itself is not bad now the word yukta can mean two things it can mean regulated but yukta is also a variant of yoga so yukta means connected so the idea is yukta ahar asya means when you eat food don't just get, don't just eat food like a pig <laughs> eat remembering that this is manifested by the mercy of the lord offer prayers you be conscious of krishna you and then even sapna about this even when we sleep we offer prayers before sleep we offer prayers after waking up so similarly a recreation let your recreation be connected with the lord connected with higher reality the verse is not specific about the personal divinity but higher reality let art be uplifting so if you see before the modern times whether it is in india or even in the west now now the west primarily means america previously the west meant europe so if you consider in europe the art was largely sacred michelangelo leonardo leonardo da vinci all of them most of the celebrated arts are in some sacred context not all but most of them so the idea is that yukta viharasya that even entertainment was meant to be spiritually connected and that's how the temples would 
to be places where those who were dedicated to the arts they would live and they would cultivate those arts exclusively so so that means they were not prostitutes but they were <laughs> women who were not married who were devoted to the arts and th th those women would be referred to it like devi das is one name referred to it as a respectful name of to refer to it so that's one understanding of this and of course the system of devi das is also eventually became degraded that there is always the possibility for any system which is meant for good to become corrupted so it is not that it was always ideal but the purpose was noble and that it, it did preserve the tradition for a long time but over a period of time it did become corrupted at least in some places so that's one understand that this does not literally mean prostitutes means uh, women people who sell their bodies that's not the meaning of that that's one understanding the second understanding is that let's we could say like in, you know if you have pendulum there's a conservative understanding so you know no there are no prostitutes there that this this only means women who are like the devi dasis then you could say that they could have the other pen, so the pendulum is the liberal understanding it is that that even in a place like dwarka it is not necessary that every single person would be equally devoted to the lord they were devotees but are all of them equally devoted to the lord is every single one a pure devotee in the sense of having the same level of devotion <clears throat> and even if you say dwarka it is a city it is still a, ca a capital people will visit there from other places and in one sense there will always be people who who will who will have desires that cannot be fulfilled within the normal boundaries of society and rather than such people uh, preying on uh, preying on those who are normal who are normal members of society there is arrangement in society for that <clears throat> and when that happens that is now that is also a part of society that is not something which is which is recommended that is not something which is mandated but that is what it is and we see that the bhagavatam also describes pingala in the 11th mm -hmm. canto mm -hmm. and again in the bhagavatam itself if you read the text carefully there is no negative description by the narrator oh she was a terrible person no she says that i am engaged in this terrible profession so so the idea is that there is a there is a there is a need in many societies in most societies for some activities like just like we say that vedic in in the vedic tradition meat was allowed it's not a it's not a recommendation but it's a concession a recommendation means you should do this concession means okay you want to do it i'll let you do it there is some arrangement for you to do it so that's a concession so even in that society not everybody necessarily was equally pure and for those people who had particular kind of desires they were they were fulfilled there were arrangement for fulfilling those desires and it could be that this is not necessarily meant for people who were in dwarka see one thing that would happen is that in the past uh, while there are always people there is always uh, we could say good and bad there is always virtue and vice but at the very least vice was frowned upon vice was seen as wrong as bad as unhealthy uh, uh, and in that sense that itself created a certain level of uh, hesitation pause in engaging in it because there will be some amount of social disapproval associated with it but uh, the problem in kali yuga is often sin is glamorized is not being frowned on or reproached it is glamorized say for example in the movie if there are some suggestive scenes or even explicit scenes then the the way it is phrased is there are there are many bold scenes now what is the implication when you say that is bold somebody who does not do that is cowardly <laughs> now this is this change of vocabulary is often the precursor to change of culture mm -hmm. so the terms we use are important 
So the values are changed. It's like, say, instead of calling something as uh, as illicit or wrong, it's an adult entertainment. Now, what does adult mean? Like when you get an adult, you get a license. You, when you get an adult, you get voting rights. When you get a, become an adult, you watch this kind of entertainment. No, it's not adult entertainment. It is adulterous entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is sometimes the euphemistic words are used. Harsh reality is described in uh, in politer terms, which is actually meant to cover the reality. So there will always be uh, people who are virtuous and there will always be people who have vices. That's, that's going to be there in human society. The danger in Kali Yuga is that often sin is glamorized. So here, if you see, it's not that the prostitutes are glamorized. It's that their attraction to Krishna is being praised. So, the, 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 so even if we take that liberal understanding, that yes, there were prostitutes. And they don't have to be prostitutes who are meant for people in the world. That people, who, it's, a, it's a capital, it's a big city. There are people who visit there. Like if you go to Vrindavan now, in Vrindavan, it's very difficult to meet a Vrajwasi. <laughs> what I mean by that is, many of the people who own the businesses in Vrindavan, they are people who emigrated from elsewhere. And they don't have the mood of Raja. They don't appreciate the mood of Raja. <laughs> now, we may say, okay, Rajivasi, how do you define a Rajivasi? Well, there are many ways of defining it. One is, anybody who lives in Vrindavan is Rajivasi. So another is, one who, anybody who is born in Vrindavan is Rajivasi. Hmm? Could say that anybody who actually appreciates Vrindavan is a Rajivasi. And appreciates Vrindavan, not because it's a big commercial opportunity. I can earn <laughs> So many tourists coming over. Appreciates Vrindavan for its spiritual wealth. That is a Rajivasi. So, if we go to Vrindavan and we meet only commercial people or commercially minded people who are just out to get our money, we say, what kind, what kind of sacred place is this? What kind of sacred people are here? And those people are there. But they, if you are going to Vrindavan, don't focus on them. Focus on those who are Rajivasis in the third sense. Those who appreciate Vrindavan. And they are there. Many people are there like that also. So we could say that there is the conservative understanding that they were actually just women who were artistic and unmarried virgins. And or there were there were women who were who were there for uh, for addressing the needs of particular social class of society. Uh, the, but in between is you could say there could be both. That so the point is that when such a, such statements come, neither Shukde Goswami feels the need to explain it. Nor does, no, sorry, here it is Sutta Goswami. The Sutta Goswami feels the need to explain it. Nor do the Saushana Kadi Rishis. They, uh, they feel the need to question it. So that means it's not that big an issue for them. And we could say that they are much more serious about raising consciousness. They have decided, they have dedicated themselves to for, perform a yajna for countering the effects of Kali Yuga. And by countering the effects of Kali Yuga, they are singularly focused on doing that which will purify them, that which will elevate them. So if they were found finding this objectionable, they would have immediately paused. Why are you describing this? In fact, you will see in the first canto itself, they do this. When it is described, when, when later on or uh, when basically Sutta Goswami describes that there was this uh, there was this man dressed in black. He was beating a cow and tormenting a bull. So immediately the sages stop. You know, he says, this is unpalatable. You know, we want to hear about Hari. If this is related to Lord Hari, then continue speaking this. So it's not that they are just passive hearers. They are active listeners. They are asking, they are asking questions when it's appropriate. So if it is not such a big issue for them, we don't have to make it such a big issue. So the point, the point is to focus on the point of the point. And if we understand this, you know, I'm a part of the Shastri Advisory Council and we have designed a whole course on hermeneutics. So hermeneutics is basically the, the way to understand scripture. You say, I just read scripture and understand scripture. Well, yes and no. Sometimes reading scripture, reading is important for understanding, but there are principles which we need to consider to understand things properly. <laughs> and one of the principles, um, there are many principles in that. 
one of the principles you consider the context. If, if, if say for example, the moon issue, Prabhupada has made multiple statements on a particular issue. We don't have to absolutize one statement. You know, a different devotees can have different positions. Yeah, maybe they went to the moon, maybe didn't go to the moon. If a devotee believes that people went to the moon, that's not a problem. You know, it's not that when a devotee is, uh, is at the end of their life and they're going to the spiritual world, Jay Vijay will ask him, do you believe man went to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> that's an irrelevant issue, isn't it? So we don't have to make uh, something which is not central to scripture, central to people's access to scripture. So similarly, this point is not a very central point in scripture. And the, the point of the point is everyone is attracted to Krishna. Uh, in Dwarka, even the prostitutes, whatever be the reason, whatever be the context, even they are attracted to Krishna. And even they come to Krishna. So does this, uh, are there any questions about this right now? Yes, many questions. I presume. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, probably the point of the point could also be based on our personal understanding or personal, you know, because the speaker may be making a point, and the people who are listening, everyone, based on their hmm. conception, they could they could make a different. That this is the point of the point. That okay, that's a good point. Good point again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, let me see if I have an illustration for this. In Rasta life, many Prabhuji's don't understand the point of the point. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is everywhere, the point of the point. It's, it's easy in relationships that... Uh, it's In relationships, it's very easy. One person is saying one thing, another person is understanding another thing. But when in a close relationship, there's a lot at stake, then it becomes a problem. It becomes a bigger problem. So, okay, there are three things over here. I'll see, if, first let me explain and then I'll see if I can find a slide for this. Let's see, there is, scripture is not static. It is dynamic. That means that a particular point is there is quoting in context and there is quoting out of context. But there is, in between the two is quoting beyond the context. It is not out of the context. I'll explain what I mean by this is that Quoting in context means, okay, this is the verse, this is spoken before this, 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 and this is what it means. That's quoting in context. And quoting out of the context means we take a point and use it to teach something which is contradictory to scripture. That is out of, there's an, it, is, it is out of context in one sense, it's opposite to the, opposite to the intent of the speaker, opposite to the overall intent of the message. So that's out of context. But there is quoting beyond the context. And scripture has that versatility. So for example, most famously, when in the Ramanand Rai Samwad, there is this discussion of various levels. So there, actually Sarva Dharma and Parityajya is quoted at a very little lower level. And Shriya Shruti Mudasutya Vipo, that is a little higher. So why is Sarva Dharma and Parityajya quoted at an intermediate level? That he says, Sarva Dharma and Parityajya, Krishna is saying, Mahaprabhu says, do Parityajya of this statement. <laughs> <laughs> do give up this statement. Go higher. So the point is, in that context, when that verse is stated, the focus is not on Maam Ekam Sharanam. It is on Sarva Dharma and Parityajya. Because the previous level is, do your Varanashram duties. And the next level is, give up your Varanashram duties. So yeah, that's good. But the point is, after giving up Varanashram duties, what are you going to do? That is the key pack. So many times, scriptures can be quoted beyond the context. In fact, that's what makes scripture alive, scripture relevant. So uh, Prabhupada would often quote, say for example, Sangat Sanjaya Yate Kamaha. So there, if you look at the sequence, what it means is that we contemplate on tempting objects, we develop attachment to them. And then from attachment, craving comes, irresistible craving comes. Sangat Sanjayate Kama. There's, there's a lecture of Prabhupada, where Prabhupada takes Sangat to mean association. And he says, according to your association, your desires will develop. I mean, say, hey, is this valid? Is this bona fide? Now, Prabhupada is saying this. So we say, how can it not be bona fide? Okay, but is this what Krishna meant? But in that context, that may not be the meaning immediately. 
but that's a valid meaning it is scriptural teaching that sangat sanjayate kama if you associate with drunkards prabhupada said will become a drunkard in association desires will develop cravings will develop so it is it is it is fine to quote a scripture for a point beyond the context and that's what makes scripture valid no, not valid relevant so no, sorry relevant so now we have to be careful that the point of the point that we are taking is not against what the speaker is speaking or what the uh, book is saying that we have to be careful about okay thank you yes probably yeah uh probably i wanted to also just uh, share that in this past time when the varunakas are actually coming out and they are you know appreciating krishna and welcoming him the other members of the society the dwarka vasis everybody who's out there nobody is opposing them and you can see that there is this mood of cooperation of everybody coming together to glorify krishna there is mm -hmm. no abandoning there is no rejection there is no neglection of that certain class of society which exists there is more of an acceptance and there is yes this is something that is there it is part of society it is something that is you know according to the norms there is nothing against anything and everybody is now coming together to glorify krishna so this kind of what it is that's a very good point that nobody else hey, you are coming here you know all those people are there the women are closing the eyes of their children <laughs> <laughs> nothing like that so actually if you see this is very very good point you made that even in the chaitanya charitamrit when it is described in puri there is a in the last section of the ante lila last 10 chapters of the cycle completely mahaprabhu's ecstasy mm -hmm. but there there is a description of the fisherman How Mahaprabhu gets caught in the fisherman's net. Mm. Now there is no mention that Krishna says, "Oh, he's engaged in such a terrible profession. He's killing animal, killing fish, and eating." No, that's a part of human society. So yes, that's a that's something which is so the idea of stigmatizing people and looking down on them because of their profession. So, for example, untouchability, what is there in Indian society? It has come more from tradition than from scripture, mm. and Krishna himself differentiates. when he is asking the rajivasis of nanda maharaj you are doing this puja of indra is it a scriptural worship or is it a traditional worship so everything traditional is not necessarily scriptural scriptural is what is taught in scripture traditional is what has been going on for a long time so that's why there is there is this you know when there is this fear that in trying to reach out to people today there might be some deviation so yes deviation can come from the contemporary society but deviation can come even from the tradition hmm? like the whole caste system the caste by birth that's a deviation from the tradition so we have to be very careful that when we are practicing hmm. bhakti that we don't bring our preconceptions based on our culture and our tradition into bhakti and impose them this is the right way to do things Now, some of those traditions may be valid some of them may not be so, so it is true the stigmatization was not a major part of the broad vedic tradition some people say that oh in india the lower castes were so much exploited and discriminated against and uh, i say that uh, that it is uh, it is because they discriminate against that this is a terrible system well okay maybe if the lower castes were so discriminated against then why did they stay on in the hindu religion or whatever the vedic tradition we don't the word hinduism might not have been there at that time why did they stay on they could have all gone to buddhism they could have all gone to jainism there are other religions which came up at that time they could have all gone to islam they could have all gone to christianity but they have not done that but the discrimination was there but that was not the defining characteristic of society that was not the primary lived experience of people yes we live this way they live that way and we live here they live there there's a distance but just because there's a distance and difference doesn't mean there is discrimination the different people live differently so sometimes we uh, so just yes, that stigmatization is not definitely not a part of scripture and that is not a prominent part of the tradition although it may might have become in some places at some times okay thank you Yes, Mr. Yadav, come on. 
company. Um, can you also date the, the, um, the souls are attracted to Krishna? What the, what the women are doing is just for their body, uh, keeping up with their body. Yes, that is true. Can you repeat the question? Yes, the question is that can we say that their souls are attracted to Krishna and the women are doing something which is just required for, for their yeah. sustenance? Yeah, that's possible. As I said that. So I was talking primarily from the perspective that so in society, there are some people who have these kind of cravings and they need to be fulfilled. But from the perspective of those who are doing it, is it that they are doing it willingly and happily or is it they're doing it because they have no alternatives? So it is, it is quite likely that it is a lot latter, especially in society where, so while there is no stigmatization, but there is certainly, there is social approval and disapproval of certain things. And that is important so that people, see, our conscience alone is not always enough to keep us on the right path. Hmm? So that's why social disapproval of wrong things or bad things is important so that we don't go on the wrong track. Suppose we get angry and we feel so angry that we want to use some foul words. Now, uh, if we, we are in a culture society, we may be angry, but even our anger will be within the limits of the cultural society. Isn't it? We may not use certain words which are, which, are, which are obnoxious. So, and that is good. Why let that such kind of language come on under? So, ideally, is that our own conscience prevents us, our own culture, our own discipline, our own conscience prevents us from using those words. But sometimes our conscience may not be enough because the urges may hit us very strongly. So there is social social approval and disapproval of certain actions, uh, and that is valuable. But from social disapproval of certain actions to stigmatization of certain classes of people, that is very different. So it's not that society is completely relative, but it is that people were not stigmatized. So in that case, yes, from the individual's perspective, what you're saying is, is it's a reasonable inference that they were, that the fact that they were attracted to Krishna indicates that they were not consumed by sensual passions. If somebody is consumed by sensual desires, then they will not be able to focus on higher reality. So that fact that they were attracted to Krishna means that might have been a part of their life. And society might have defined them by that particular role, profession. But that was not who they essentially were. In their self-understanding, their heart was not in that. So that, that's also an important point. Thank you. Yes. Can you just point to the point, please? It's very valid in the whole discussion of the way we address Prabhupada said in our society, that's become such a tool for, you know, oh, Prabhupada said this. But Prabhupada said different things in different <coughs> contexts, different ways, and how we take that, because we, we really, um, I guess, in a society like that, that Prabhupada said is, has become, mm -hmm. this, um, becomes a governing factor without discrimination. Yeah, that's of, true. Uh, that's true. When and why and where Prabhupada said what he said. True, yes. Could you recap? So sometimes, if, we, if you don't understand the point of the point, the, the, that, that problem is increasingly coming in our movement because Prabhupada said that statement is used often to hammer down certain points. Yes, I was just talking with one senior Prabhupada disciple, very close to Prabhupada. He was, and he was telling me that, that he, I was asking, what is the greatest danger to our movement's future? What is, okay. okay. What is the greatest danger to our movement's future? He said, Prabhupada said, <laughs> you know, that we can use Prabhupada's statements to actually do harm Prabhupada's mission. So all of Prabhupada's statements, huh? Somehow, it's not just Prabhupada made such mm -hmm. statements. You know, from today's perspective, you take any leader, even 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and 30 years ago, their statements can seem problematic. 
But does that mean that those leaders have to be condemned and rejected? Or does that mean there is? No, it's not like that. So it's, there will be some problems with certain statements which Prabhupada made in today's context. Uh, in his context, what he made, the problems might be there in today's context. So uh, we have to understand, always remember, Prabhupada's purpose was the international society for Krishna consciousness. And uh, if you look at this, uh, so we have to, again, to come back to the point of the point. So what was the point of everything that Prabhupada said? It was to raise Krishna, to help people become Krishna conscious. So in our hermeneutics, we have discussed about, you know, if you, in the different ways, you don't have to go to hermeneutics. If you look at, look at Shila Prabhupada himself. What did Prabhupada say were the purposes of his con? Purpose, if you see the seven purposes of his con, they're very universal to correct the imbalance of values in human society, to bring people closer to each other and closer to Krishna. Prabhupada doesn't mention any of his socially controversial teachings or any of his controversial points in the seven purposes of his con. So any statement that Shila Prabhupada made, we have to see how it is fulfilling the purpose of Shila Prabhupada. And if it is not, then it is important for us to understand it and explain it in a way that fulfills the purpose of Shri Prabhupada or at least does not obstruct the fulfillment of the purpose of Shri Prabhupada. Otherwise, we will be coming to Niyamagraha. That means insisting on the letter of the law while for forgetting or even defeating the purpose of the law. So that, that's a very important point. Thank you for making that. So one last question, and we'll stop with this. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you were talking about the Waka, how there's different levels of devotion amongst the residents there. So we know the um, narration, how when Krishna wanted to leave, he wanted to um, rid the earth of his, um, his own family because they were so invincibly powerful. But um, in those purports, it says, First of all, they were always thinking of Krishna, you know, while doing everything, sitting and working and eating. But then um, also it said they were indifferent and even some were inimical and puffed up from being Krishna's direct sons, the sons of Krishna. So they had that fratricidal war. So how can it be that they are all of these things? And of course, it wouldn't be all of the sons. He had an awful lot of sons. Okay. So there are various descriptions of the residents of Dwarka. For example, they're constantly thinking about Krishna while eating, while walking, while working, while sleeping. But sometimes it is said that they were puffed up and they got intoxicated and they fought and then they killed each other. And so how uh, there are various descriptions. How do we understand this? In general, Bhagavatam is Sometimes we forget that it is poetry. It is, it is, it is, it's, it's the art form. And in, in poetry, there are, in poetically conveying things, there is an implicit understanding when something is to be taken literally and when not to be taken literally. So, 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 for example, this is all the Dwarkavasis were chanting the, were always absorbed in Krishna. Now, does all mean every single one all the time? Does it mean even the non human beings? So, all could be a poetic expression rather than a literal statement. Because we also see that there are some Dwarka, when the rumor started spreading, that Krishna has killed was Satrajit. Yeah. So, so then what happened was the Dwarkavasis also started suspecting and Krishna had to do take emergency action to restore the reputation. So what does that mean? That means that you know even if we say somebody is a pure devotee, if the word pure devotee, it's a, it's a, it could be an elastic term in the sense that it could mean some devotee in whose heart impurity can never enter. Or it could mean some devotee in whose heart presently there is no impurity. But that does not mean future impurity cannot come. Or it could also mean, as Prabhupada said, that potential pure devotees. It could mean pure devotee means that in 
in their heart there is no attraction to impurity there may be presence of impurity right now and they are fighting against it sometimes they may succumb to it but they are not actively pursuing impurity desires they are not so for example sensual desire or lust may be present but they are not cultivating sensual fantasies they are not consuming content that will trigger their sensual desires so purity pure devotee can mean many different things so 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 if we take the second meaning so that at present there is no impurity in their hearts but yes certain circumstances may change and sometimes impurities may come in so we understand that life is dynamic consciousness doesn't always stay the same that's why it's it's a relationship with krishna so pure devotion it is it is both a journey and a destination it's something you wish to achieve but it is a constant expression of the heart so it is something which you have to constantly keep expressing and manifesting as we become purified the influences that take us away from krishna will become less influential less forceful and in that sense choosing krishna will become easier but for the soul the option to choose something other than krishna is always there okay hare krishna prabhu dhanvat pranam uh, this is parikshit priyadas and we have three devotees online who have the questions if, in case if you have some time is that okay prabhu so i have time for questions not for answers <laughs> go ahead please oh thank you vijay mata ji can you go ahead please hari krishna prabhu ji thank you so much for such a nice class prabhu ji i have a question so we said that the point of the point is universal attraction for krishna but we see that some people are envious of krishna so was it a poetic um, expression okay when i said the point of the point is to illustrate the universal attractiveness of krishna but you see some people are averse to krishna also well so i was making the point that in dwarka at that particular point everybody was attracted to krishna that's what is being illustrated over here so context so in that context that point is there now apart from that you could also make another point that um, even those who seem to be averse to krishna they are actually attracted to an opulence of krishna so when uh, duryodhan is attracted to the kingdom krishna says everything attractive manifests a spark of my splendor so when he is attracted to kingdom also he is attracted to a part of krishna but that attraction to a part of krishna a part of krishna's opulence is taking him away from krishna so there is nothing attractive in this world which exists outside krishna by the the way i put it some everything attractive comes from krishna but everything attractive may not take us to krishna <laughs> so yes some people who are averse to krishna means they are attracted to something which is not taking them towards krishna but taking them away from krishna okay, okay. yes thank you prabhu madhav oh, prabhu do you want to go ahead next yes hi krishna prabhu yeah there were a couple of points that i i missed one was that you said that you wanted to discuss three things you know the point the point of the point and i think the third thing was the context of to understand the, the point, point to understand the point in the light of the point of the point so is to under, to understand the point in the light of the point of the point that's the third thing yes i will share the screen right now so so basically what i did was you see the, the point was okay there this and this vara mukhya also who came running out to behold krishna the point of the point was that everyone is attracted to krishna and then the then we see the point in the light of the point of the point so then i gave the liberal understand the conservative understand the liberal understanding so that's how i did the third part is it clear now actually i'm sorry it's actually not <laughs> okay so so because understand what, the point of the point that up to that i understand you know why do a person make this point but then after that now the third so thing once you understand is, that point uh huh let me i give the example of same moon mission so the yes. point of the prabhupada everything everything says it was to raise people towards krishna consciousness to inspire people to raise their consciousness so then in that light how do we see prabhupada's moon statements 
we see them as okay they, they don't get excited by it don't let your consciousness get consumed by it focus on purifying and elevating your consciousness oh so, so that is we see the point in the light of the point of the point let's um, consider the, the point of the point is a little confusing it is just a play of words but sometimes play of words mm. uh, doesn't work so well so let's say the point and then the purpose of the point okay? mm -hmm. the point purpose and once you understand the purpose then you revisit the point in the light yeah. of the purpose yes yes that's clear prabhu thank you and then also the other thing was when you were um you use verse 1866 to illustrate the fact that um sometimes something can be taken out of context sometimes things can be taken beyond the context right so out of context means that you use a statement that is and use it in a way that's contrary to let's say the point that's being made the purpose right? let's use the, the purpose word. the purpose yes. and then when you take it beyond the context this is where i'm confused i think you use 1866 to illustrate how you can take a point beyond its context so i'm not sure how what that means to take it beyond the context okay let me think of some other example beyond the context means that say in the bhagavad gita krishna says that uh, that he tells arjuna that dehi no smi yatha de now krishna is saying that your essential identity is spiritual now why is he telling this to arjuna over there because arjuna is caught between his identity as kshatriya and arjuna as a, a kurunandana so there the point of krishna is to to emphasize that arjuna because you are a spiritual being don't caught in the, get caught in the duties associated with these identities focus on a higher purpose but in today's world we may take the point that uh, that krishna talks about how our essential identity is spiritual to make some other point say for example we may say the bhagavad gita says that consciousness does not come from the brain it does not originate in the brain because consciousness is a symptom of the soul and the soul is different from the body it's different from the brain so this is not the point that krishna is making in the bhagavad gita but it's a valid usage of the point that consciousness does not come from the brain we say is there a specific reference in the bhagavad gita for this well no the bhagavad gita doesn't talk about the brain itself it talks about buddhi which is different from the brain but if you want to bring the bhagavad gita's wisdom in a dialogue with today's world then we can definitely say the bhagavad gita says the consciousness does not originate in the brain but what is the basis for that we'll say avinashi to tadviddhi ena sarvam idam tak that which pervades the entire body that is indestructible that comes from a non material source so this is quoting beyond the context this is quoting mm -hmm. beyond the context so if uh, um if somebody is you know depressed because of maybe they are overweight or they they are not so good looking or whatever and then i was once giving a class and there was one uh, i was speaking how we are not the body and there was one person in the audience it was very overweight and he said, Thank God, I'm not the body. <laughs> <laughs> so now Krishna did speak the "You're not the body" to relieve people from the de dejection that might come because they don't have a very attractive body. But if that is raising them above bodily consciousness, that is getting them out of their depression, that's a valid usage. Hmm? so that's quoting beyond the context but interestingly that person said afterwards i am not my body but i am a gujarati <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes people will not get the point actually they just use the point for their own purposes <laughs> so so quoting out quoting out beyond the context means that we see that scripture offers wisdom for a particular purpose at a particular time but the wisdom can be used for many purposes beyond that purpose mm -hmm. yes so, so mm -hmm. that is the point of quoting beyond the context 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you. Great. We have one last question, Prabhu. Madhu Prabhu, do you want to go ahead? Hare Krishna, Dandavat Pranam, Asnambul Vaishnavas, and special Koti Koti Pranam to Chaitanya Sharan Prabhu. Uh, thank you so much for yeah, giving me opportunity, Parikshita Maharaj Prabhu. So, so my question is actually more or less like, yeah, just what I get take home message from. First of all, I would like to say that we are looking, everyone, whether devotee, non-devotee, is looking for the bliss. We are even material world, bliss. Every effort is focused towards bliss and immortality, even that why Hirani Kasipu was looking. Of course, he was, which is not real, but we can be immortal and soul never dies. So in fact, we are immortal if we consider that Bhagavad Gita, the true concept. So, so with that said, I don't want to go too much detail, but you, with your talk, and as actually in Living Name Sachinandan Maharaj's book, he talks about devotee of Krishna association is very, very infectious. So his cousins, if you are there, you will get infected. Prabhupada talks about it, Prasadam, you get infected by and developed. So in summary, Prabhuji, you gave tremendous bliss the way you talk, make us laugh and laugh. That's, I can see a devotee pure giving that, providing the bliss in first place. So anyway, I like to thank you so much, but I had a small little kind of my take home message that you talked about this word uh, which meant prostitute, but also it can have many meanings. You describe that. Of course, it's a negative connotation when one talks about word prostitute. But the problem is even many successful materialist CEOs of the company who are big leaders in current time, even they use the word positive thinking, positive, make everything out of negative. You never put that thing. Try to look for sorry the little positivity in that. You. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm getting your points, but I'm not getting the point of your word. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm sorry. I'm sure. sorry. I'm not, not, I'm very bad communicator. But what I'm saying that even you talked about that main context, actually, of what is the goal of that uh, Dwarika Leela, what the process, mm -hmm. everybody's included being attracted. That's the main goal. So why recently people were, they mentioned, this is the truth. This is the reality. Okay, just, is there sorry, for just, reasons, sorry, sorry to interrupt but, you. Okay, let yeah. me ask some fundamental thing. Is this a question or is this a comment? It, it is so. all, all of those. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is on your line and not even understanding a question of questions. That's, it is in that line. So I don't understand. So that's why it is all of those. Thank you, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>